Hello and welcome back to the Elephant Lounge. I'm your host Tuesday. I want to thank you so much for joining me once again. And this is episode six of why they are guilty. But before I get into the real meat and potatoes of this episode, I want to tie up some loose ends from the previous episode. And one of those loose ends involves nomenclature. And this simply means that there are words that are used in our everyday language that mean something. And then when when they are applied in the area of science, they might mean something a little bit different. One of those words I want to cover is contamination. Now, it's interesting because I once had someone argue with me repeatedly about contamination and try to suggest that contamination in a lab is the same as uh, cross-contamination in food, and that just simply is not the case. A contamination in a lab can be a number of things. It doesn't necessarily have to be a bacteria, nor does it have to interfere with a genetic sample. In the case of Stephen Avery, there was a sample that ended up being contaminated, and this was the bullet that was found in Stephen Avery's garage, which had Teresa Hallback's DNA. Unfortunately, the person that was doing the test, testing the woman, I I forget her name, I apologize, but she was speaking and somehow got a bit of her saliva through spit inside of that genetic sample. And as a result, she was able to figure out the genesis of that contamination. She then extracted her her profile from that sample and took the results to another laboratory, which would be a superior of hers, who would then peer review her work. And of course, they approved of the sample being used. Now, the thing that I want to express here is that yes, contaminations can occur, but it's not synonymous with, oh my gosh, we've got to throw everything out. If you know what happened and you can account for how that contamination occurred and what the contamination is, then it's perfectly acceptable to use those results. Every lab that I ever took, the first thing that was told to the students was do not hand in a lab paper that has zero mistakes. I want to see that you've scratched things out. I want to see that you've made some mistakes because no lab is going to be completed without something, some error happening or occurring, whether you write something down wrong or you misspell something and have to cross that out. There's always going to be at least some mistakes made. That's just the reality. Of course, you'll write your report and that will be separate, but your actual lab paperwork, it's going to have mistakes. That's just common. But just because mistakes were made doesn't mean you cannot arrive at an accurate accurate answer. It'd be like if I told you to take a math test. I'm sure we've all taken math tests. At some point, you probably went through the equation and you realized you made a mistake. You crossed that out. You started over. You redid your work and you arrived at the correct answer. But see, you did make a mistake and we can see that you made a mistake because you crossed it out. That doesn't mean that the whole answer should be thrown out because you had made a mistake. No, you corrected it. You figured out what happened, you were able to give a final answer that was correct. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Contaminations inside a lab are very different. They can come from a number of sources. They can they can be the result of a number of things. But if the person doing the experiment can account for that and tell you what happened and how it happened and how they're able to save that sample, then there's nothing wrong with using the final result. That's what matters. Now, another word that comes to mind that's often used in everyday language is the word positive. We think of positive as something, happy thoughts, good thoughts, thinking about good things happening, or, you know, anything that denotes a goodness, as it were. Um, but the word positive in 
science or maybe in psychology, that is the presence of something or the introduction of something into an equation. And a negative refers to the removal of something. So in the area of psychology, for instance, a good example of this is, you know, corporal punishment. If you're punishing a child and you use corporal punishment, that is a positive form of punishment. Not that it's a good thing, but it's that they have added something, okay? They have, there is a presence of something in that type of punishment. If However, you're somebody that takes away their games or their phone or something that would be a negative form of punishment. So the words positive and negative take on different meanings compared to how we use that word in our everyday language. So we always want to be aware of these subtle differences and what they mean. And usually if there is something presented at trial and a scientist has to testify, all of these things will be explained. They will be explained to the jury, but it's up to us to listen to those things and not try to conflate these terms with everyday language. We need to always pay attention to that. So I really just wanted to sort of go over that. And it's just something that I hadn't mentioned prior. Now, let's get into the case that I want to present for you. One of the criticisms that I commonly get from people is, well, you just think everybody's guilty. That's what you think. You're just a hater. You know, of course, I'm just this awful person because God forbid I look objectively at things. But the fact of the matter, is, yes, there are cases where there are innocent people who are convicted. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen. And today, we are going to look at such a case. Now, some of you may have heard about this case already, especially if you're a bit of a true crime junkie. Others might not know this case very well, but I'm going to get into it because I covered it years ago. And it is fascinating. It is a doozy. It is just the craziest case I have ever encountered. I don't know any other case with so many twists and turns. And after we get done with this, we're going to talk about why this case is so different from, you know, these other cases that we see. What's really interesting, though, is that during all of this, I don't remember the Innocence Project or any of these people that talk about advocating for wrongly accused people. I don't remember them ever becoming involved in this case, which is very odd considering the circumstances of this case. So let's get into it. Now, first, I want to tell you, I was contacted by a Facebook friend. So this was back in, let's see, I wrote about this November 10th, 2014. Just before this, uh, a friend that I had met on Facebook, they had contacted me because they wanted me to check out this murder case. And it was starting to garner a lot of attention. And it does include an episode on Dateline. So Dateline's done, I believe, three total episodes, two or three episodes on this case. So they've they've already done one and then they did an update. And I, I want to say they did another update on it because, uh, as I said, this case has so many twists and turns. It's insane. But my friend knew that I had a blog and he was interested in alerting as many people as he could about the details of the, this case. Because you see, my friend is also friends with the man who was being accused of murdering his wife. So this is something that I wrote back, as I said, in 2014. So I will read what I wrote and then I'll go over the updates and stuff. And I think that you'll find this rather fascinating, even if you've heard of the case before. So the man is Russ Fair. Area, and his wife was Betsy, and she's also known as Elizabeth. I believe that was her real name, Elizabeth, but she went by Betsy. Now, a cursory view of this murder case left me with some mixed feelings because I have this friend telling me, you know, look, this is my friend. This is an old roommate of mine. He's being accused of murdering his wife. And I'm kind of looking at it and I'm thinking at first it just sounds like a typical crime of passion. A husband kills his wife, says he's out with friends, tries to clean up the evidence, pretends he wasn't there when the murder happened. It's a slam dunk because most everyone understands, especially the police, that crimes like this always point to the spouse. It's just common 
common sense. It's something like 85 to 90% of people who are murdered if they're married, it's the spouse. Now, the 911 phone call was rather odd to me as well. Certainly, you'd expect a man coming home to find his wife in a bloody mess to be distraught, but there was a phrase that stood out, a typical sign that authorities would note as someone being guilty. Why did she do this to me? An innocent person almost never thinks of themselves or their own feelings. Russ also admitted his wife was dead during the call. This is another indication of guilt. Innocent people are rarely able to accept the death of a loved one. Rather, they will scream for help, insist on medical treatment, avoiding all all niceties. They are not nice. They do not say, hi, how are you? Now, add to this the fact that Betsy was stabbed over 50 times and Russ stated he believed Betsy had killed herself? Huh? Now, yet, as this story unfolds and a timeline begins to take shape, it becomes more and more clear that Russ is an innocent man. As of now, as of writing this, when I wrote this, he was convicted and has been sentenced to a life in prison. So many questions questions. How did this happen? If Russ didn't kill his wife, who did? And for what purpose? Was this really a crime of passion or was this a killing that was planned and executed? Did someone stand to benefit from Betsy's death? Allow me to start with the night of the murder. 2011, December 27th, Tuesday. Betsy had a chemo treatment on that day. Yes, she had cancer and was told she did not have long to live. She then was reported to have gone to her mother's. Russ was supposed to pick her up, but according to him, Betsy told him not to bother because she was going to have a friend bring her home. According to surveillance cameras, Russ had gone to at least two gas stations around 5.15 p.m. The first one he stopped to get gas, and another station he bought cigarettes, dog food, and a couple of iced teas. Russ then made his way to his friend's house, about 35 minutes away, where four other people, three male, one female, were present. This group of friends routinely enjoy a night of gaming once a week in order to stay in contact and have fun without spending a bunch of money. According to Michael Corbin, who hosted this game night, had this to say. So I actually interviewed Michael Corbin for this article, and you can see him on the Dateline episode as well. We'd been doing game night for around three to four years previous to Betsy's murder, and the rest of us still play game night to this day. Every Tuesday, we'd get together, play one of a couple board games or old-fashioned pen and paper role-playing games. We've added a few more games to the list than we had when Russ was with us, but we still all enjoy to get together and play. Betsy never came to game night, but not everyone likes sitting around playing board games or RPGs. We'd had a number of other players come and go over the years, but Russ and the rest of us were the core that were always around. Russ's friends have all stated without a doubt that Russ was with them that night. According to them, he had arrived about 6 p.m. or just before that time. Cell phone records also confirm that Russ's phone was pinging at a tower that was near Corbin home confirming his location. Russ left Corbin's home between 8.45 p.m. and 9 p.m. And he also has a receipt from an Arby's that is located near his friend's home. The timestamp was 9.09 p.m. Russ then would drive straight home and at around 9.40 p.m. the 911 call was placed. On the other side of this equation, our soon-to-be murder victim Betsy was with a friend of hers named Bobby. Betsy had texted another friend of hers, Pam Hupp, at some point telling her she did not need a ride home, but Pam showed up anyway. Pam would state that she dropped off Betsy at her home and drove home, leaving Betsy alive and alone. Based on phone calls and statements, and the fact that nobody says they saw Russ home, the time of Betsy's arrival to her home is placed around 7 p.m. or a little after. It should be noted that Betsy had has two daughters from a previous relationship. Their names are Leah and Mariah Day. One of the daughters indicated that she had spoke with her mother and was expecting to speak with her soon after. However, calls from her daughter made at 721, 726, and 730 p.m. all went unanswered. There is a phone call from Pam made to her husband that went unanswered at 7.04 p.m. After Pam left Betsy again around 7 p.m., she made a phone call to Betsy at 7.27 that went unanswered 
answered. Pam told the police she thought she called to let Betsy know she made it home. However, cell phone pings would reveal that she was still near Betsy's home. Pam lived about 30 minutes away. Russ leaves his friend's house at around 9 p.m. and stops at an Arby's. He then makes his way home. When he arrives, he discovers Betsy had been killed. He sees slashes on her arms and a knife in her neck. Russ called the police and they came to the house to investigate. Here is the rundown of what was discovered during the investigation. Number one, Betsy's body is already cold and stiff. Number two, Betsy had a knife in her neck and had been stabbed over 50 times, yet Russ claims he did not see all of the wounds. In fact, most of her wounds are covered and it is confirmed that many of the stabs were made after Betsy was already dead. Number four, the police take out the plumbing and it's discovered that nobody had recently showered or rinsed off. There's no blood in the drains. Number five, Russ does not have any blood or DNA on him. In fact, he's wearing the same clothes that he was spotted on camera wearing at the gas stations he visited before going over to his friend's house for game night. Number six, it is discovered that Betsy and Russ did not have a perfect marriage. It is reported that both had cheated on one another. Like other couples, they went through their problems. There were mixed reports and feelings from friends and family concerning the possibility of Russ being involved. While some believed it to be true immediately, others stated it was not likely or even possible. Number seven, at the time of the murder, Betsy had been diagnosed with cancer for a second time and was essentially given a death sentence. Her cancer had previously gone into remission and then came back. The chemotherapy was done for the purposes of lengthening her life as much as possible. Number eight, blood was found on a light switch. There was another male DNA profile discovered and Russ's profile was ruled out. Number nine, Russ's slippers had blood on them and they were thrown in the master bedroom closet. No other prints were found. Number 10, eight semen cells were found inside of Betsy that belonged to Faria. This is very much consistent with what Russ told police, that him and his wife were intimate on Sunday night. And the kicker to this all, just four days before Betsy was killed, she changed the beneficiary on her life insurance policy worth $150,000. Who did she list as the new beneficiary? Pam Hupp, the last person to see Betsy alive. Yet, Police never really focused on Pam. They considered her to be cooperative. They asked her for the clothes she wore that day and she provided them. However, there's no one else to really confirm if those were indeed the clothes she had worn. There's no reference to her home or car being searched. The police seem to have immediately pointed the finger at Russ and anything that did not seem to support his involvement was dismissed. Pam was also very eager to badmouth Russ to the police. According to her statements, she told them that Russ was mean and would play games with Betsy. He would put a pillow over her face and told her, this is what it feels like to die. Nobody else could confirm this ever happened. Pam revealed something else to police as well, a motive. She claims that Betsy was going to tell Russ that night she wanted the family to move in with her parents and they would rent out the home they were currently living in. Pam said Betsy wanted to be closer to her family and closer to the location she was receiving her chemo treatments. Betsy told Pam she was anxious about telling Russ this news because he was going to be upset. He was tired of moving around and would have no interest in moving in her family's home. So who exactly is this Pam Hupp? In my interview with Michael Corbin, I asked him if he had discussed Pam with Russ. What did Russ know about Pam? Here's what he said. In my last visit to see Russ, I asked him how well he knew Pam and he told me he'd met her once, maybe twice. Certainly not a best friend to Betsy. In the reports I have read in listening to recorded parts of Pam being interviewed, it has been stated that Pam knew Betsy for about 10 years and they had met through work in the insurance industry. Pam is about nine years older than Betsy and there are reports that Betsy had complained to another friend that Pam was smothering her. Pam is married and I am unsure at this point how many children she has, but it does appear she is a mother. I've been told that her and her husband own a few businesses, but it seems as though the husband is who takes care of most of the endeavors. This 
I cannot confirm or deny, but Pam told the court in her deposition that she collects $800 per month for disability. I guess that she has some problems with her back, her legs, and her fat ass. I mean, her back and her legs. Well, what about this insurance policy? I'm glad you asked. This is where Pam's story becomes more and more questionable. The police dropped the ball completely on these details, and only now we are finally discovering the lies that Pam told police during their original investigation. The daughters of Betsy are suing Pam Hupp for the life insurance money. Pam has refused to give them any amount. So let's just go back to the time just before the murder. Four days before, we know Pam and Betsy had visited the library in Wing Haven. The purpose of going there was to have the librarian witness the signature of Betsy, who in turn signed over her life insurance policy to Pam Hupp. The library assistant is a woman by the name of Lauren Manganelli. So far, I can find no connection with Lauren and Pam. Lauren said during her deposition in 2014, July 22nd, that she saw Betsy and Pam come into the library and were there about a half hour organizing papers and then they approached her in order to ask her to witness the signature. She says the date was 2011 December 23rd. Pamela did most of the talking during this exchange. Pam told Lauren that Betsy, or aka Elizabeth Feria, was getting a divorce from her husband Russ, and because of this, she wanted to sign over her policy to her best friend Pam. Either Pam, Elizabeth, or both did mention that Elizabeth, Betsy, had children and the money would be used for them. Lauren specifically says she did not ask either woman for identification. This is in direct contrast to what Pam Hupp has told the court. She claims her and Betsy had both shown their IDs to Lauren. Now, I'm unsure why a notary, I'm assuming it would be a notary, which is why they went to the library. I still don't understand how you wouldn't ask for an ID. In an earlier statement given to police by Pam, she confirms that Betsy wanted her to be the beneficiary of the life insurance policy because she wanted to make sure that her daughters get the money when they are older. She was concerned that they would blow through the money or her family would do the same. Pam was to take the money and disperse it to them later on. Just days later, Betsy is killed and Pam is all too willing to work with the police. She immediately goes into attack mode and goes after Russ, telling police all the nasty things about Russ and how Betsy was afraid of him. She even told police Betsy was hiding a knife for protection from Russ. Pamela is asked about the insurance policy at some point, but she never mentions that her name being listed as the beneficiary is written in still very fresh ink. Russ is arrested for Betsy's murder, and a case is being worked against him. However, despite Pam's claims to police that her intention of giving the daughters money from the insurance policy, Pam had yet to even put the funds into a trust for them. Instead, she deposited deposited the funds into a joint checking account with her husband. The trial for Russ is soon approaching, and the police call Pam down to the station. They express a concern that she has yet to put the funds from the insurance policy into a trust for the girls. Pam is not at all faced. She tells the police she has every intention of doing so. She told Betsy's father that she did set up a revocable trust for the girls in the amount of $100,000. Where's the other fifty? thousand. Well, apparently Pam took it upon herself to take that money and give it to another woman's daughter who was 12 years old. Supposedly, this other woman died of cancer and Pam is using money intended for Betsy's daughters to help this other girl and her family. The story does not make much sense and Pam does not provide any real details. She is very vague and offers no explanation for how she arrived at this decision to just change the wishes of her best friend who had just been murdered, according to Pam, by her own husband. Russ Feria is convicted of his wife's death. Despite his seemingly airtight alibi, the judge decided to suppress all the information pertaining to the insurance policy. According to what I've read, the judge justified this decision because the state of Missouri has a law that says the defense is not allowed to use the some other dude did it defense. Even worse, the judge insisted that there was no direct link to the 
crime scene and Pam. Wasn't she the last person to see Betsy? Since none of this information about the insurance policy was allowed, Pam was free to testify and not answer any questions pertaining to her being listed as the beneficiary, nor when she became the beneficiary. The jury was originally split 6-6, but according to some of the jury who had agreed to be interviewed by media outlets, they were not all fully swayed by the alibi witnesses. A closer look at how the prosecution closed their case might have something to do with this confusion. Without any warning, the prosecution decided to present their theory of how Russ was able to kill his wife. The prosecutor insisted that Russ's friends were all in on the crime. Russ drove out to Corbin's house so he could leave his phone in order for it to ping off the towers 35 to 40 minutes away from his home. He then drove back home, got naked, had sex with his wife, because those chemo treatments always make a woman feel sexy afterwards, killed her, washed off, though there's no indication of that happening, had his friend stop at Arby's to get a receipt, because I guess he knows there's no cameras there, and then the friend drops off the phone for Russ so that he could then call the police, and of course, nobody witnesses any of this because his friends have supernatural powers that allow them to travel invisible to the naked eye. Just before police get there, Russ sees some blood on his slippers and throws them right into the master bedroom closet where no policeman would ever look, ever. Yep, sounds legit. Hold on there, Sparky. I thought the police were saying this was a crime of passion. Pam said that Betsy anticipated Russ to be angry about having to move in with her relatives and renting their home out. Or was Russ going to be angry about being removed as the beneficiary? Or was it because Betsy was getting a divorce? What the prosecutor did was present an entire story that shows premeditation. So what exactly was Russell angry about if he had yet to hear any of this bad news that Pam claimed Betsy was going to tell him that night? The prosecution wants it both ways. They are trying to tell us Russ got angry about something, yet that something did not ignite his temper immediately. That something would have festered and culminated to a man planning the killing of his wife and going through great pains to establish several alibis even including his phone pings, not to mention he was able to avoid being spotted by anyone. It doesn't matter whether Russ was naked or not during the killing. It would have been necessary for him to wash off, but where? He couldn't be so careless to clean off at home, and it's clear he didn't since the pipes were checked and it was established that nobody had showered. Even if he he and Corbin worked something out, he couldn't take the chance of washing up over there because if you're going to go through all these pains to cover up, you would not take the risk since you would assume the police would look at your alibis. Russ would have had to have enlisted the help of another person as well, and there's just no indication that he did any of this. It's fairly clear that around 7, Betsy was still alive and the unanswered phone calls seemed to point to her death being killed between 7 and and 7.15 p.m. For whatever reason, the jury did not understand, and rather than being prudent in their decision, they convicted Russ. Worse yet, the four alibis have all been flippantly accused of being accessory to murder. However, they've not been charged. While the prosecutor was allowed to slander them in court, the four friends insist they are not involved in any way. They have come forward to demand the prosecution do something. They refuse to abandon in their friend in his time of need because they know it's simply not possible for him to have killed his wife. I will also note here that a jury member got a phone call from a friend who worked at the courthouse. She told her friend after the verdict that Russ was innocent and proceeded to tell him she was privy to the information that was withheld from the jury. Turning up the heat on Pam Hupp. After trial, Hupp revoked the trust set up for Mariah and Leah, Betsy's daughters. She is now completely denying that the money was ever for them. In fact, her story now is Betsy told her she didn't want anyone in her family getting any money. Betsy wanted Hub to have all of the funds. She also claims that she never told anyone that she was going to give $50,000 to another girl who lost her mother to cancer. Huh? Hub also tried telling the court that Betsy had 
frequently changed her beneficiary on her account. This is untrue. In fact, the policy appears to have been 10 years old. It's only ever been listed under Russ. There are no records of Betsy changing the policy at any time, even during rough times where the couple had split for a time period. Pam Hub has told different people different things about dropping off her friend that day. In fact, she told Betsy's mother and father that she did not go inside the home. Yet, when she spoke with police, she had different stories. Initially, she did not go in the house. Later, she said she did go inside and Betsy turned on the hall light. She left Betsy on the couch lying down because she was going to watch a movie and it all happened really fast. Pam also said it's possible that Betsy walked her to the door. Please make note that the hallway light is one of the locations blood was found. And what exactly happened really fast? Anyone listening to Pam, as she explains this to police, can visibly see a woman trying to keep her story straight. She knows that another male DNA profile is on that light switch. She also knows she left Betsy on that couch dead. People always have a habit of drawing attention towards things they do not want people to know about. It's just psychology. It has also been discovered that Pam had created a flyer for another friend who was dying of cancer, Laura Murphy. This flyer was used to collect money for her friend. Laura has since passed, but her husband James was confronted with the flyer by Chris Hayes, who is a reporter who did a lot of research on this case, because it seems our sweet Pam was actually going out collecting money for Laura and her family. While James confirmed the picture on the flyer was indeed him and his family. He had no clue Pam created this collected money, and he never saw a dime of the money collected. In my interview with Corbin, he relays this. I cannot imagine why Betsy would sign over her insurance policy to Hup. To this day, I really just don't get it. I don't know anyone that would do something like that when they are surrounded by family. Indeed, what kind of a woman would want to deny her own children money from a life insurance policy? Why have one at all if that's the case? There's no indication that Betsy's relationships with her daughters were strained or unusual. The purpose for having the life insurance is to ensure that your family has enough money to take care of funeral arrangements and to cover the costs of the bills that remain. Certainly a woman going through chemo treatments would leave behind some medical bills. $150,000 is a very modest policy. I have yet to find any other information concerning another policy that Pam spoke of to police. According to her statement, she had knowledge of another policy. She refers to it as this universal life policy in the amount of $100,000 that was placed in her cousin's name, Linda. No other reference has been made and I don't know if Linda received anything. Oh, and something else about Pam. She had told police she had no motive as far as money was concerned since she was planning on collecting half a million after her mother passed away. Later, when she made her deposition for the pending action against her from Betsy's daughters, she stated her mother did die only a few months after Betsy did, and she did not receive $500,000 at all. She denied ever saying that in the first place. She even stated her mother died from Alzheimer's. Well, um, yeah, that's not really the story here. Shirley Newman is Pam's mother, and actually she fell through the third floor balcony railing of her apartment to her death Thursday afternoon at a retirement home near Fenton, police say. Yep, that's right. Pam's mother died from falling to her death. One must wonder if this aged woman riddled with Alzheimer's was actually given a slight push from behind. Police said there was damage to several vertical bars of the balcony railing, but that the top horizontal bar was not damaged. We are all hoping the police catch on before another accident happens around Pam Hupp. Now, Dateline covered this story, and then they also did an update, and I feel as though they did two updates, but we're going to get into some of that as well, and I will be leaving links for everybody. So sometime after I wrote this, Russ was ordered a new trial, and his attorney had asked for 
a judge. So this was good news for Russ Feria. More than a dozen witnesses were called to testify, but were not called to the stand. Michael Corbin was one. Corbin is one of four people who said they were with Feria during the time of his murder. He's been outspoken about Russ' innocence since Russ's 2013 conviction. After court today, he said, for the past two years, almost, we've been watching this whole thing play out. I can't believe what's happened, but I'm just so overjoyed by what's happening today. Russ will be vindicated in his new trial, and the whole world will be able to see he didn't kill his wife. Pam Hupp was sued for the insurance policy money that went to her by Betsy's children. During her deposition, Pam changed her story completely, claiming Betsy never wanted her children or her family to get the insurance money. This is not what Pam told police when she was originally questioned, and her statement was very clear in communicating with police that the purpose of Betsy signing over the policy to Pam was for the sole purpose to ensure Betsy's daughters would indeed get the money because, according to Pam, Betsy was concerned Russ would spend the money. It is painstakingly obvious that this woman cannot keep her story straight, and that's interesting since she's the last person to see Betsy alive. After the trial, now here's what happens. Russ gets another trial. The judge finds him not guilty. He is released. On November 7, 2015, Faria's conviction was overturned. Now, just to back up, I'm going to go on to the Wikipedia page for Pam up here, and I'm going to read a little bit of this. The St. Louis Post-Dispatch published an expose revealing that the $150,000 received by Hupp had been kept by her rather than put into a trust for Betsy Feria's daughters. Now, initially, she claimed she had not entered the Feria home after driving her home and then revised this account twice. The expose also featured an interview with the 911 operator who'd taken Russ Feria's call, who stated she believed his hysterical state upon making the call genuine. The expose also claimed that prosecuting attorney Leah Askey had been in a relationship with Mike Lang, the then captain of investigations for Lincoln County Police, and one of the investigating officers in the Betsy Feria murder case who testified against Russ Feria in his trial. Two members of the jury in Russ Feria's trial approached the media to flag concerns that this information had been withheld. So then, as I said, they appealed it, and during the retrial, Schwartz, this is uh, his attorney, was allowed to introduce evidence implicating Hupp as the perpetrator. CSI agent Amy Butner had examined the crime scene, stated she believed the blooded slippers found in Russ Feria's closet had not stepped in blood because it looked like they had just been tapped in the blood and then thrown in the closet. During the trial, police officers also discovered that Hupp, who was not called to testify, had claimed in interviews conducted in June that she and Betsy Feria had been in a sexual relationship. Hupp also stated to police that she had remembered seeing Russ Feria and and another man in a car parked in a side street outside the Feria home as she drove Betsy Feria home. I mean, how does she just keep making this stuff up? It's so bizarre. Okay, so he is released. Now, here's where the stuff gets really good, okay? This is where we really need to just holy cow, what the heck just happened? Pam has been arrested, and you're never going to believe this crazy story. We are talking epic fail, epic stupid. Louis Gumpinger was found dead. Oh, I'm going to, I'm spelling that name wrong, or I'm saying that name wrong. Louis Guppenberger, I'm sorry, I'm pronouncing that wrong. Guppenberger was found dead in Hub's home after she called police informing them a man was trying to break into her home. Initially, Initially, not much information was known about what had transpired other than we were told Pam was cooperating with authorities. How nice of her. Police have finally laid out the evidence against Pam and why they have chosen to 
finally throw this psychotic bitch behind bars and this story is a doozy let me tell you here we go several days before this shooting took place Pam approached a woman and told her she worked for Dateline she offered this woman a thousand dollars to read a script that Pam claimed would be them reenacting a 911 call the woman initially agreed but became suspicious when Pam could not provide any credentials this woman then told her Facebook page and warned people about a blonde woman in an SUV claiming to be with Dateline. That post reads, be cautious of a blonde lady in black SUV trying to pick people up and take them from the neighborhood, not saying where she's claiming to work for Dateline. Cops have been called. That's not a very good sentence, but you get the idea. When people found this woman, she also described to them the 911 call Pam wanted her to record. It sounded eerily similar to the call police received when Pam reported this break-in. With all the new information police know, it is believed that Pam had approached Lewis just outside his apartment building. Her cell phone shows it pinged right near here apartment complex about 40 minutes prior to her 911 call. Since Lewis was consistently described as someone who was trusting and gullible, Pam's offer of $900 for reading a short script likely seemed believable to Lewis and he trusted her enough to get in her vehicle where she proceeded to drive home. The reenactment was then played out resulting in Pam shooting Lewis and murdering him. Police say they they discovered a note in Lewis's pocket that described a plan for Lewis to kidnap Pam, take her to the bank, and get Russ's money. And then Lewis was instructed to kill Pam and bring the money to Russ. Accompanying the note was $900, and this note was recognized by police as having been planted on Lewis. Can we just stop and laugh hysterically for a few moments? Holy cow, this is ret- Hearted. So Pam wanted the police to believe that Russ tracked some guy down to get money from Pam and have her killed. This guy was actually supposed to get over a hundred grand from Pam kill her and actually bring it back to Russ so that Russ could give him a paltry 10k and all this was written in a note the hitman was carrying on his person so this was a plan it was just all written out in a note that he put in his back pocket oh but it gets even more stupid no no I'm not kidding Pam told police that someone dropped Lewis off and he approached her in her driveway, held a knife to her throat and physically attempted to push her into her vehicle so they could get Russ's money. She also told police she didn't know a Russ. What? What the ever-loving fuck? She just went through a murder trial where Russ was the defendant and she was a star witness and can't think of who Russ is. Someone slap her around, please. Being the super Pam she is, she managed to get away from the strange man holding a knife to her and she runs inside her home to call police. She then claims this man came into her house and she was forced to grab her gun from her nightstand and when he came closer, she shot him dead. Wow, what a hero she makes herself out to be. And in reality, she's just a coward and a cold-blooded killer who has the mentality of a child. So this old fat woman collecting disability told police she got away from a younger man holding a knife to her and she expected someone to believe this? Oh, Pam, you did not think any of this through, did you? What makes this even more hilarious is by doing this and getting caught, she fully implicated herself in Betsy's murder. Why else would she bother with such an elaborate hoax? Pam was arrested. Having access to a pen, Pam went to the restroom at the police station and stabbed herself in the wrist and neck, just like how Betsy died. But as with everything Pam does, she failed to rid the world of her sorry-ass existence. She was taken to the hospital and treated. From what has been reported, it seems Pam may have carried out this murder as a way to deflect pressure from police, who have likely reopened the Feria case. It has also been stated that police are re-examining Hupp's mother's death and found no wrongdoing. However, most people online, especially 
especially, are convinced Pam helped push her mother to an early grave. Now that Pam is behind bars, it'll be interesting if her husband says something to the media or to the police. Who knows what twists and turns are ahead, but if the past is any indication of the future, this is going to be even more interesting. And I did want to mention with the lawsuit and the insurance policy, if I didn't mention this before, uh, she did win that case. The Somehow, I don't know how, but the judge ended up ruling in her favor and not the daughters, which was absolutely insane. So she walked away with that $150,000 and then of course she goes through all this trouble and in the Dateline update, they go through a whole thing about her mother because that death does not look legit. They're, they show what the railings look like and the top railing was still there, but it's as if she went through the bottom portion, the vertical railings, which I don't know how you would do that. So just going through and looking at her death, again, this is on the Wikipedia page of Pam Hupp. Newman spent the night on October 29, 2013 with Hupp following a hospital visit at approximately 5 on October 30th. Hupp dropped her off at her apartment, instructing staff not to expect her for dinner that evening or breakfast. A housekeeper found Newman dead beneath the balcony of her home at 2.30 p.m. on October 31st, 2013. The aluminum balcony railing was broken. Following a police investigation, Assistant Medical Examiner Raj Nanduri concluded she had died from blunt trauma to the chest resulting from the accidental fall. An autopsy found she had 0.84 micrograms of the sedative zolpidem in her blood, over eight times the expected concentration for someone having taken a normal dose. On November 2013, the Lincoln County Police received an anonymous note suggesting Hupp had murdered her mother to receive life insurance. Hupp was the last person known to have seen her mother alive. Hupp and her siblings each received approximately $120,000 of investments held by Newman, as well as sharing a $10,000 life insurance payout. Earlier that year, prior to her mother's death, Hub had been videotaped saying, my mom's worth half a million that I get when she dies. If I really wanted money, there was an easier way than trying to combat somebody that's physically stronger than me. The police reopened their investigation, but after interviewing the housekeeper who had found Newman's body and Newman's son, Michael, both whom stated Newman was unsteady, again concluded her death was accidental. They did not interview Hupp. How did they not interview Hupp? What is going on with this police station? In 2016, after Hupp was charged with the murder of Lewis, the St. Louis County Police again reopened their investigation. Newman's son, Michael, reiterated he believed his mother's death to have been accidental. Detective Matthew Levy attempted to get a subpoena for the location of Hupp's cell phone at the time of her mother's death, but was unsuccessful. Levy also attempted to organize forensic tests on the balcony railing at the Missouri University of Science and Technology, but the Lakeview Park Independent Senior Living Community refused to provide a railing for testing. Unbelievable. In November 2017, Mary Case, the chief medical examiner for St. Louis County, changed the manner of Newman's death from accidental to undetermined. Case stated, since Newman's death, many things have happened that involved the daughter, and so all that investigation, including the one in Lincoln County and the one in St. Charles, became pertinent information. I was no longer willing to say it could be an accident. The investigation into Newman's death was not reopened. In May 2018, St. Charles County Circuit Judge John Cunningham ruled that prosecutors in the trial of Hupp for the murder of Louis Gumpenberger could not present evidence relating to Newman's death. And that is terrible. I don't know how she got away with that. On August 23rd, 2016, Hupp was arrested, charged with first degree murder and armed criminal action. Upon being arrested, she asked to visit a bathroom and that's where she 
you know, used her ballpoint pen to stab her neck and wrists. Uh, bail for Hupp was set at $2 million. On December 16, 2016, a grand jury indicted Hupp for first-degree murder and armed criminal action. Hupp appeared in court on January 31st, 2017, pleading not guilty. In March 2017, prosecutors stated they would seek the death penalty due to the apparently arbitrary choice of Guppenberger's as the victim. In August 2018, 18, Hupp's trial date was set for June 2019. On June 19, 2019, Hupp entered an Alfred guilty plea to the charges of first degree murder and armed criminal action waiving her right to a jury trial. As a condition of a deal struck with prosecutors, Hupp did not face the death penalty. She was sentenced to life imprisonment without possibility of parole on August 12, 2019. She is serving her sentence at the Women's Eastern Reception Diagnostic and Correctional Center in Vandalia, Missouri. I'm pronouncing all of that wrong. Vandalia? I don't know. Anyways, so if you, I will provide links. I'll find everything for the dateline and stuff. It's all very interesting. They do a really good job at going over all the various lies that this woman told. I mean, this woman just could not keep her story straight. Every single time she was interviewed, she would change something. She would change her story. So the big difference with this case, and when we look at these other cases, is that Russ always had a consistent narrative. This is what I did. This is who called me. This is where I went. This is when I came home and I called the police. There was never any inconsistency in what he stated he was doing and his phone also confirmed all of his actions as well as his friends. There was never any wavering or inconsistency. That is an innocent person. An innocent person is somebody who can tell you what was going on, what happened. Their story is consistent. It's always going to be consistent. When somebody is guilty, what they're going to do is they're going to try and poke holes in everything because that's all the defense can do. They're going to try and go after forensic evidence. They're going to try and say, oh, well, that couldn't have been true or, or this happened and, and that's why that test result turned out the way it did. They go after the forensic team. They go after the investigators. They continuously make allegations. When it came to Rusferia, there did appear to be some corruption that was going Going on with the prosecutor and with the lead detective. There were some issues going on, and then I it doesn't mention it here, but I I know that there was a report where somebody had s- stated that Pam Hub was actually connected with some of these people, and that's why they immediately trusted her. So we can't know every little detail and every little corruption, but for whatever reason, investigators really did get it through their head that hey, this is what happened. It's a husband. Obviously, it's him who did it. And they just sort of stuck with that tunnel vision throughout the entire investigation. And they just kept going forward regardless of what happened. There's also another little story here. I'll just read this really quick because I found this kind of interesting. Suspicion swiftly fell on Russ Feria. His initial assertion that Betsy Feria had killed herself was considered to be ludicrous by first responders who observed her body. A search of the house by police found a bloodstained pair of slippers in his closet. His volatile emotional state was regarded as suspicious by police. He ostensibly failed a polygraph test administered by police. When interviewed by police, Hupp claimed Russ Feria had a violent temper. He was a heavy drinker. He had threatened Betsy Feria and that Betsy had been considered leaving him. At the behest of Hupp, police searched Betsy Feria's laptop and found a document in which Betsy Betsy Feria purportedly expressed fears that her husband would murder her. It was later revealed that the document was written in a Word 97 software that was not installed on that laptop and was the only document on the laptop with 
author unknown. On January 4th, 2012, the day after Betsy Faria's funeral, Russ Faria was charged with the first degree murder and armed criminal action. As he was unable to meet his bail of $250,000, he was held in the jail until November 2013. And that was a weird thing with this letter. She kept telling the police to look for this letter. It's on her computer. It's on this computer. And they finally did. But I think it was, uh, if I remember correctly, it was Russ Faria's attorney who's the one that ended up going through this and saying, wait a minute, this doesn't even match. This is the only document on here of an unknown author. So somehow she put a document on this woman's computer. This was all very much planned. How far in advance did she plan this murder? And the fact that she had essentially gotten a away with it for quite some time. So I'm going to stop here because this is going on pretty long. In the next episode, I think we'll talk just maybe a little bit, maybe tie up some loose ends, and then we'll get into some more new stuff for you. So I hope you enjoyed this and I will be back. 